Good morning, Rotarians and guests. Good morning. I'm Ron Strobel, the Sergeant at Arms. Our invocation this morning is by Joe Avell. Good morning, Rotarians. Good morning, Good morning. Well, those of you that don't realize that uh, with the weather outside, we're only into our, the second week of the year. So I thought that an invocation for the new year might be appropriate. And this, uh, this invocation was written by a uh, fellow Rotarian, Sean L. Bird, in uh, British Columbia. A very attractive Rotarian, I might, I might add. Is that Sean or Sauna? Sean, uh, from her website, she, uh, she writes a oh, number so she, of okay. yeah. <laughs> you now, you? <laughs> we, we were wondering where this, where, where this invocation was right. going, right? I know it's going to two dollars. I know. All right. All right. Last New Year is a time for new beginnings, as well as a time to reflect on the past. Is it a chance? It is a chance for us to celebrate our successes and plan to have a wonderful year. As this new year begins, let us consider how we can use the next 12 months to make a difference in our community, our nation, and the world. Let us be thankful for what we have achieved, but mindful of our, our responsibility to continue our good works. Our commitment to service can make the world a better place. Amen. 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 <laughs> it was very nice. Two dollars. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. It was better than okay. <laughs> exactly. To lead us in the pledge and the four-way test, Andy Morse. Right. Hey, 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 look who showed up. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Good morning. Good morning. I am Andy Morse. I've been a member of your club since 1988, and I am really glad to see so many brand new faces out there. <laughs> <laughs> I am so pleased that we have so many new guests today. So, thank you kindly. Is that still one dollar? Andy, no, right. Andy, Andy, these are all members. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're members? Oh, yeah. no. They're not guests. So, <laughs> That's a dollar. <laughs> so, if you would, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Yeah. I pledge allegiance, pledge allegiance to, to the flag. flag. Of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And then, one of the exciting things that we do every morning the four way test. And every morning in the shower, when you're not here, do it yourself. The four way test. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, We'll build, we'll build goodwill will and better, better friendships. friendships. And fourth, will we'll be, be beneficial, beneficial to all concerned. Again, nice meeting you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Andy. And to lead us in song, Dick Pearsall. Well, you know, we're all very proud of, Ohio, of the Ohio State. Yeah. 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 Well, on top of that, I love the United States, and I'd like to get us going today and Heat it up a little bit by singing God Bless America. I think All that's right. what I'm doing. Right. God, God bless America, land that I love. Stand, Stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans, white with snow. God bless America. My home, sweet home. Oh, Come on, Annie. God bless America. My home, sweet home. Oh, there we go. There we go. Woo! I Good job, good job, good job. I think everyone sings much better when Dick uses both arms. I'm glad to see that shoulder back in service again. Tom used his whole body. <laughs> and our president, Allison Feaster. No, All right, we're off to a good start, so let's keep it up. <laughs> 
don't do it. Who's making a difference? Yes, now I've omitted the second part of that. I finally have given it up. <laughs> I'll, make it a, I'll make it a rotary jeopardy question. <laughs> All right, Jimmy. Oh, wait, Chris, first. We have guests. Good morning, Rotarians. Good morning. We have a few guests with us today, and I would like to announce the, their names, and if they could please stand up so we can give them a warm welcome. First, we have Drew Hall from Kent State and guest of Rich Warfield. Good morning, Drew. Good morning. And then we have Peter Goheen, guest of Max Wendell. Good morning, Peter. Thank you for joining us. First time you visited us. Hey, you Maybe forgot you Andy. Come you forgot Andy. You forgot Andy. <laughs> Oh, and Andy Morse. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. It's nice seeing you again. It's been here. Right. Hey, I almost got perfect attendance. What happened to Andy? <laughs> All right, Jimmy, are you ready now? And don't trip on these cords. It's okay. I know a good attorney. Yeah. <laughs> There's no such thing. There's no, yeah, that's an oxymoron. That's an oxymoron. Oh, man. Oh, our member who joined in 1988. We also have a member who joined in 2012, and that is Greg Tallman, and his sponsor was George Snyder. So a little round of applause for Greg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now it's time for... Is that right? <laughs> From the pit the Just going to make it play. Like, oh. Ron's ready? Hit, huh? Remember, I will give you the clue, and you have to be the first to raise your hand and give the correct response. Phil Tobin, in the form of a question, right? All right. This pianist Rotarian is proud to be a Phi Delt and an officer of the U.S. Navy, but he is most proud of his 47 caddy. Who is Phil Tobin? David Basil. Who is Phil Tobin? Yes, come get your prize. Uh-oh. <laughs> there he is. give that prize to my wife. We have a deck of crazy eights for you. Just what you need on a cold winter day. In honor of Phil, crazy eights. <laughs> history is next up. Duncan Tanner, are you ready? I am. All right. Uh-oh. What do you mean trouble? Uh-oh. Did you hear that? Dick was calling him trouble? <laughs> Is there idle chatter during history? <laughs> Good morning, fellow history buffs. Good morning, Duncan. Good morning, Duncan. Good morning, Duncan. <laughs> Today, ladies and gentlemen, Rotary and the Red Scare. As we discovered while learning about Clarence Darrow and William Jennings Bryan's role in the famous Tennessee Monkey Trial, Rotarians are often passionate and resolute in their philosophies and positions. Senator Joseph McCarthy and broadcast journalist Edward R. Murrow were two such Rotarians. Born and raised in Wisconsin, Joe McCarthy attended law school and became the youngest circuit court judge in the state's history. When World War II broke out, he enlisted in the U.S. Marine Corps. After the war, McCarthy, who actually never saw action, but convinced a fellow Marine to take a picture of him in the tail gunner's pit of a B-17 <laughs> under repair, got the picture published in Wisconsin newspapers with the caption, Tail Gunner Joe, and used that publicity to successfully win a vacant Wisconsin U.S. Senate wow. seat. His early years in the Senate were not particularly effective until 1950 when McCarthy made a name for himself. On February 9, 1950, he gave a speech to the Wheeling, West Virginia Republican Women's Club. During that speech, McCarthy pulled out a piece of paper which he claimed had on it the names of 205 high-ranking public officials 
who were known by the Secretary of State to be communists, but were still working and shaping policy in Washington. Although it turned out that the paper he held up was blank, <laughs> this shocking statement began the era that came to be known as McCarthyism and the search for the Red Scare. In the 1950s, the U.S. Senate held committee meetings to expose communists. During these hearings, many people became blacklisted because of their alleged Communist Party affiliations. Among the most famous victims were composer Leonard Bernstein, actor Charlie Chaplin, writer-actor Orson Welles, writer Langston Hughes, playwright Arthur Miller, and actor Edward G. Robinson. These people had to suffer through accusation, accusations that they were communists, even though it was never proved. These accusations proved to, the, to lead to the premature end of many careers, the loss of family and friends, and in many cases, suicide. After graduating from Washington State College, now Washington State University, Edward R. Murrow joined CBS as Director of Talks and Education in 1935 and remained with the network for his entire career. Murrow went to London in 1937 to serve as the Director of CBS's European Operations, staying in Europe to cover World War II. Later, he would become known as the forefather of broadcast journalism. Murrow created a program called See It Now, the precursor of and inspiration for 60 Minutes which focused on a number of controversial issues in the 1950s, but is best remembered as the show that criticized <coughs> McCarthy and the Red Scare. He considered McCarthy the worst sort of bully, and on March 9, 1954, Murrow, CBS division president Fred Friendly, and their news team produced a half an hour See It Now special entitled The Report on Senator Joseph McCarthy. Murrow used experts from McCarthy's own speeches, I'm sorry, excerpts from McCarthy's own speeches and proclamations to criticize the senator and point out episodes when he actually contradicted himself. Still frightened of McCarthy, however, CBS chairman William Paley refused to support the broadcast. <coughs> Murrow and Friendly paid the production and advertising costs themselves and were not allowed to even use the CBS logo wow. during the broadcast. Wow. The See It Now program, more and more accusations without evidence, and an ill-advised campaign to take down General Ralph Y. Zwicker, one of the most decorated commanders of World War II and Korea, as a suspected communist, led to McCarthy's eventual downfall. He died in 1958 at the age of 47 of complications from alcoholism. Two men, two Rotarians, a very pivotal time in history. Thank you. Always great, Duncan. Thank you. Next, Rich Warfield is going to introduce our speaker for today. Well, I know it's tough to follow last week's act speaker that we had who spoke on taxes and tax updates. <laughs> no. Rich, you just keep digging the hole. <laughs> <laughs> and I see uh, Andy finally got his blue badge, so that's good. Welcome to the club. <laughs> we have a pretty feisty group this morning. I think everybody's been held captive inside their houses or offices. So. Yeah. Keep it up. It's good. It's healthy. Anyway, uh, we have two Kent Staters here today. Uh, Drew Hall I've met through the alumni program and he's stayed in touch with me being a former Kent State grad, hard to believe, 32 years ago. Uh oh, Duncan's writing this down. <laughs> 1983 I graduated from Kent State with a uh, BBA, so uh, I've been working in public county for 32 years. But anyway, it's not about me. Was that a GED you got or what? <laughs> I never got D's, Andy. <laughs> Yeah, you worked in public accounting 32 but years. But anyway, um, we one. have a special <laughs> guest with us today, uh, Deborah Spake from um, Kent State, and I'm going to read her bio. So it's about 10 minutes long, so it'll leave her about five minutes to speak. <laughs> but uh, we won't mention the school that she got one of her degrees from that happened to be along the way or on our path to the national title. 
but they have a very established program down south, strong SEC program. Oh. And oh. trivia question is, uh, as Allison would say, what coach besides Urban Meyer won a national championship at two different schools? There you go, Allison. <laughs> Who is Nick Saban? <laughs> so, yes. So, um, anyway, enough of football, but we are very proud of our Ohio State Buckeyes. As dean of the college, Deborah will be responsible, or is currently responsible, because I think Deborah's been in the position for at least a year or two now. Two years. Two years. Um, for matters is the development and supervision of the program budget, recommendations regarding the appointment and the retention of staff, recommending and implementing the program and course offering offerings, establishing course assignments and workloads, assisting the administration of the university personnel and affirmative action policies and enforcing all university regulations. Some of the stuff I'm going to just kind of go over real quick because she's been at a lot of different schools here. I mean, more recently she um, was the Dean for Assessment at the University of South Alabama Mitchell's College of Business. Um, she taught marketing at the University of Alabama and um, went to Western Reserve, or not Western Reserve, Western Michigan, correct? faculty member at Western Michigan, and so forth, so forth. So, um, well, she can talk about herself. <laughs> she, uh, um, Deborah's research interests include ser services, marketing, healthcare, marketing, have advertising, and business ethics. Her research has appeared in numerous public publications, including the Journal of Applied Psychology, the Journal of Advertising, Journal of Advertising exactly. Research, Journal of Service Research, <laughs> Journal of Consumer Marketing, <laughs> Journal of Medical Marketing, Health Marketing Quarterly, International Journal of Pharmaceutical and Healthcare Marketing, and Marketing Education Review. Sounds like you have a little marketing background. Um, and one of the things that Deborah didn't mention in her bio, um, I believe she is currently married, correct? And she has a son that plays on the Hudson football team. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> So I'm adding to your bio here. And he is a junior? Yes. Correct. And his name is? Brian. Brian. And there is a daughter in the picture too, right? No, I have two sons. Two sons. The other one is a senior in college. Senior in college. Okay. Right. So anyway, um, Deborah received her bachelor's degree from the University of Alabama, and she received her, uh, I'm sorry, South Alabama, and she received her master's and doctoral degrees from the University of Alabama. So with all that being said, we welcome Deborah, and we look wow. forward to your presentation. And thank you. For coming on, on a cold wintry day. Yeah. <laughs> we knew you came to Ohio for the weather. Thank you, Rich. Uh, I know that he's a Kent State graduate. Do I have any others in the room who graduated from Kent State? <coughs> All right, nice to meet alumni. Uh, as Rich said, I do live here in Hudson, so it's nice to have breakfast in town this morning. I'm usually headed out on my way to Kent, uh, and we moved here, as uh, he mentioned, about two years ago. So uh, I moved to Ohio to join Kent State, and I thought I'd spend a little time with you this morning telling you the difference that Kent State is making, particularly the College of Business. I like the way that you start your meeting, what difference are you making, and I can tell you that we're making a significant difference not only in Northeast Ohio, uh, but really across the country. What I found when I came to Kent State is often people are surprised in the area about how large we are. Um, we have a rather large footprint. Many of you know that uh, Kent State is an eight campus system. What you may not know though, is in addition to those eight campuses, we also have facilities in Columbus, in Cleveland, in New York, and also in Florence, Italy. Uh, in Columbus, Kent State delivers a, a degree in library and information sciences, not out of the College of Business. In Cleveland, uh, we have the CUDC, which is the Center for Urban Design operated by our architecture college. Uh, we also have a College of Podiatric Medicine in Independence where the College of Business does deliver our executive MBA for healthcare. And then our fashion program, which Kent State is well known for, uh, has a facility in New York. Um, and we are large. Kent State had record enrollment this last fall on the Kent campus, over 28,000 students. If you add up the students on all of our campuses and centers, um, our eight campus system and the centers now exceed 41,000 students. Uh, from a college of business perspective, and I'll go over our numbers in a minute, it makes us the second largest college of business in the state of Ohio second only to your new national champions. <laughs> there. 
internationally, though, we have a very broad footprint. So while we do have a center in Florence, Italy, where we deliver now business programs, architecture programs, fashion programs, more recently programs out of our colleges of communication and arts and sciences, those facilities have been there for 35 years. Uh, originally, they were leased for our architecture program, but now uh, a much broader array of students study in Florence each year. The College of Business also has an arrangement with the University in Switzerland under the brand of Kent State, and we send business students to Geneva each year as well. And then Kent State has recruiting offices in Beijing and New Delhi, and I'll talk more about the number of international students that we now bring here to study, as well as the students we are sending abroad. Uh, when I received the invitation to speak to the Rotary this morning, uh, it occurred to me that Rotarians are well known for supporting uh, education abroad, and so I thought I'd spend much of my time today talking about how we as a college of business are helping our students gain that experience. Um, for the College of Business, our enrollment is now 4,500 students. You may know that Kent State delivers associate degrees. Those are not delivered through the College of Business, and so they're not included in these numbers. Uh, 4,500 is bachelor's, master's, and doctoral seeking students. We deliver everything from a bachelor's degree through a PhD. Uh, on the Kent campus, that's now more than 3,300, almost 3,400 students. Seven, almost 700 of those, 690 or so, are international, uh, who come here from all over the world to study in the College of Business at Kent State. Uh, more than 1,100 are out on the regional campuses or are studying in our regional centers around the world. Uh, we are also, in addition to being large, uh, highly ranked. So the College of Business is fortunate to have dual accreditation through ACSB. That's the highest level of accreditation a college or school of business can obtain. Uh, so you can be proud of the degrees, those of you who earned them from the College of Business there. Uh, we are ranked in Princeton Review's top tier of business schools. We are ranked in U.S. News & World Report uh, and have moved up, I'm pleased to say, in the time I've been there, seven spots uh, in the last two years. Uh, CEO Magazine ranks our executive MBA program in the top 20. And we began about a year and a half ago now a sales program in the College of Business, a sales certificate. And at the end of its first year, it was ranked in the top 100 in the country by Sales Education Foundation. So uh, sales is an area where we are focusing more effort in the college. Uh, to give you some perspective globally, there are almost 16,000 business schools in the world. Uh, about a third of those um, in North America are accredited by ACSB. So just to have that accreditation, we're in the top third. But we also have the separate accounting accreditation. It's the only other type of accreditation that we offer. Uh, so where's Rich? He just loved Well, Rich's degree, uh, <laughs> accredited by ACSB, there are only 178 accounting programs in the world that have that accreditation. Fewer than 1% of the world's business schools have that, and his degree has it. Uh, and any of the others of you who happen to have earned an accounting degree from us. In the last year, uh, when I joined, I knew that we did a lot globally, but I thought that we should do more. So we were proud of the people, that the students that we were bringing from around the world to study with our students in the classroom. It gives our students an opportunity to interact for, with people from all over the world on team projects. We also have a number of international faculty. We recruit internationally, so it sometimes surprises people that most of the faculty at Kent State are not necessarily from Ohio. They're from all over the country, and 20% of them we recruit from around the world. So I, I'm in the process now of recruiting a new entrepreneurship faculty member from Switzerland, uh, who we hope to have join us in the fall. That's just one example. We have for some time had a global management center. They do international research. They also work closely with our study abroad effort. Uh, but I wanted to do more for the local community. So the U.S. Commercial Service offers uh, something called the U.S. Export Assistance Center. And we began discussion with them about a year ago to bring that into the College of Business at Kent State. 
So beginning this fall, we have an office of the U.S. Commercial Service in our building. They provide uh, workshops and seminars for free to the local community. Businesses can come to the College of Business and meet with our uh, international trade specialist who isn't employed by the college. He's employed by the Department of Commerce. Uh, and so it, over the next year, we will be working more with local communities in our Northeast Ohio footprint to get out and help businesses really understand what it means to export and how to do that and provide that assistance. Uh, because it's important to me that we not only educate the local business students about what it means to be in a global economy, but also to help our local businesses who want to have that opportunity to sell their products or reach out globally. And so we are, we are now doing that. Uh, but we do send students abroad. We offer a variety of programs, everything from two weeks abroad to a year abroad. Uh, and students have the opportunity, depending on their program that they're in, to choose which of those they want to do. The one exception is the students who are enrolled in our executive MBA program uh, do, because they're working full time, they do the shorter version. So they usually go for about 10 days, normally around spring break. Uh, we typically partner with our alumni so that uh, an alumnus who is working for a multinational corporation will host them. This year, they're going to India, hosted by KPMG. One of our accounting alum is a partner at KPMG in Chicago. His responsibility includes the India office. And so we've been fortunate to partner with them. They will host our students in India, and they'll be able to see what KPMG does in that country working with their local clients. Uh, so that's just an example of what we're doing there. Uh, but as I said, we have a broad range of study abroad opportunities. We do have the facilities in Italy and Switzerland. We signed in the last year an agreement with the university in Germany. Uh, the benefit for that is I am sensitive to the economics of studying abroad. I know that for many students, uh, if they don't have scholarships, it's very expensive to do that. Uh, historically, Rotarians uh, across the country have provided some of those study abroad scholarships, but we also have alumni who do that. Uh, and so one of the reasons I wanted a partnership in Germany is in Germany, uh, education, higher education is free. So if we partnered with a German uh, university, there was a good chance that I could get low cost or no cost tuition for our students, and we were able to do that. So they do pay for their transportation cost and their living expenses, but they don't pay tuition for this particular partner. Uh, because of the arrangement that we have with them. We do offer summer programs, uh, both in Canada and also again in Italy. Uh, those are four-week programs. Then we have some specialized programs in international business, international marketing, uh, accounting, and sustainability. Those are primarily in Europe. Those are faculty-led with Kent Campus faculty. So they'll sign up for a course on the Kent campus in the summer. Part of the course is delivered in the classroom on campus, and then part of it is the study abroad experience. So it's not a vacation. Uh, it's where they're visiting companies in other parts of the world. So typically when they go to Switzerland, they visit Nestle in Switzerland. Uh, when they go uh, to England and Ireland, they're visiting companies there, or they're visiting exchanges, or they're visiting... Um, large banking institutions in those countries, depending on the program that they're in. We have begun to do spring break programs. This year we're doing the Executive MBA, which I mentioned in India. We're also doing uh, an economics course for undergrads uh, in Belgium, Luxembourg, and France. So lots of opportunities for students. This year we will send more than 100 domestic students abroad. Uh, so we do send them abroad, but we also uh, offer internships. And so one of the things I wanted to do was it's important that students study abroad, but sometimes on these programs uh, they just don't get enough of the flavor of the country. They don't really uh, necessarily understand how businesses differ. They get some sense of that, but it's better if they can stay there longer, and for those who stay longer, it would be really nice if they had work experience internationally. Uh, for those students, they often have opportunities to go to work for multinationals. So we've begun an international internship program. I had three students uh, interning in the fall, primarily in Florence. And so not only are they studying in a foreign country, they're working in a foreign country. And we have an effort to push that. 
We do have international faculty exchanges, so in, a different, in addition to hiring faculty from all over the world, we also have visiting faculty who come in from our partner institutions. This year we had four. Uh, they came in from Sweden, from <coughs> China, uh, and from um, other countries in Europe. And again, because we bring in so many international students, we do have a multinational classroom. This photo is an example of one of our domestic students who was studying in Switzerland. Uh, as you, I'm sure, know, that's very close to the Alps. So he took advantage of the ski opportunity <laughs> while he was there. Um, we're one of Doing 90 universities in the U.S. that offer a Ph.D. in business. Uh, and you can see it is... Um, with a lot of different concentrations of minors that they can choose. So we have a full range of doctoral programs. We are turning out business educators. Um, there are not that many schools in Ohio that turn out PhDs. There are four. Uh, the, and some of them don't offer a wide range of programs. And so, uh, for example, in accounting, since we're using Rich as an example this morning, if he had wanted to go out and get his PhD in accounting, it's Kent State or Ohio State. We also offer a number of MBA programs, uh, many of them dual MBA. Uh, so when they're getting their master's degree, say in translation or nursing, they can also take on the business piece of that and come out with two MBA degrees in less time than they would if they took each independently. Um, and so you can see we have a wide range of those. We also have specialized master's degrees in accounting and economics, and we're in the process of seeking approval for a master's degree in business analytics. It's a growing area in business. You might imagine all that scanner data that's captured based on the purchases that you make or the, the customer data that's collected by companies. Somebody has to sort through that and make business decisions. And so there are programs around the country <coughs> popping up, training students how to do that. And so that's the kind of program that we're seeking. It's heavily quantitative. <coughs> Uh, we offer a wide variety of majors um, in all of the business disciplines uh, and a wide variety of minors, some of which are a little unique, like uh, military studies. We work with our ROTC program to deliver a minor through business in that, uh, as well as international business. And given that we're located in Northeast Ohio and it is such a large healthcare community, we do have some specialized programs in healthcare management. And then the sales certificate that I mentioned was started last year. The other big push that we've had in the last two years is career services. Uh, so there is a lot of attention in the media about how students incur a lot of debt going through college, and we're sensitive to that. We have a very large push at Kent State for students to get out in four years. Uh, and so the campaign that we run is take 15. If they take 15 credit hours every semester for eight semesters, they can complete in four, and we really encourage them to do that. Uh, we have a high retention rate and, and an increasing graduation rate to try to get them out the door. But then once they graduate, they have to get a job, right? And so we know that one of the, rate, the ways that they're more successful doing that is through internships and through help before they get out to really uh, land that first job. One of the things I did when I joined was in the first six months, I went out to corporations in Northeast Ohio and met with their recruiters. And what I heard was, not so politely, um, Kent State does a great job in the College of Business of educating its students. We just really wish they interviewed better. And so what I heard was, while we went to school at a time when we knew what to wear to an interview, that isn't always the case today. And so some of you may have commented or interviewed people where you thought, well, they should have known to wear a suit, or they should have followed up with a thank you letter immediately after. And, and we knew that our students, 40% of whom are still first generation students, weren't getting that. So one of uh, my predecessors had started um, an internship coordination office in the college. We had one person working there, and I thought that just wasn't enough. So with the help of some alumni, we built a career service office that opened last November. So it's only been open not quite a year. Uh, we now have, as of yesterday, 11 people working in that office. A number of them are students who are getting a graduate degree through our College of Education and Counseling, so they're providing career counseling. But we also have full-time certified uh, career service officers. Uh, we have specialized folks who work with our graduate programs and then specialized folks who work with our undergrad programs. 
We've had tremendous success in a year. Uh, we had in the fall more than 100 uh, industry people come and speak in the College of Business in just one semester, and we have more and more companies coming in to recruit. So you can see from that bar chart, uh, we've increased internships since 2008 from only 192 to more than 1,000 today. Because we know that work experience is going to help them get a job. And because we now were acquire, as of last year, a professional development course, they're going to be prepared when they do that. So we are forcing every sophomore to take a one credit hour course that teaches them what to wear to an interview, how to speak in front of an employer. We have rolled out all of these services related to the Career Service Office in the last year. Career Counseling, an etiquette program. Every graduating senior and every MBA student now has an opportunity for free to participate in an etiquette dinner or lunch where they're taught how to interview over a meal because they weren't getting that. Uh, it's not traditionally part of our curriculum. Uh, we now have an HR Summit series where we're bringing in HR professionals to speak to the students about what to expect when they go out on an interview. We have the required professional <coughs> development course. We also heard from employers that our career fairs were a little late in the uh, recruiting cycle and so we bumped that up for the College of Business and now in August do something called the Van Benthuizen Top Student Scholar Showcase. <coughs> Walt Van Benthuizen is one of our alumni who completely funds the program, which is why it's named for him. Uh, and our students have an opportunity to do what we call speed dating. Uh, I saw that University of Southern California was doing this and so I wanted to mirror it after their successful program the students come in and meet with companies for 15 minutes. So you might imagine a ballroom full of tables where students for 15 minutes meet with a company and then move on to another. And so all of these matches are made ahead of time and each student has somewhere between 7 and 10 interviews in an afternoon. And the companies are able very quickly to go through these well-prepared students and then recruit them early before the career fairs start. That's also been a very successful program for us. Uh, and then we now are doing more specialized career expos. We always had one at Kent State, a very large one that some of you may have participated in when you were students. Now we're doing specialized ones. So we have a specialized one for accounting, a specialized one for the IT industry, a specialized one for the insurance industry, and now a specialized one for the sales industry. So by doing that, we're bringing in students with unique skills matched with employers only looking for those skills. And we'll continue to do more of those. So I know that's a very quick presentation, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you have about the college. Yeah. Okay, and you're going to have a microphone first. Give me right? one second. Yeah. <laughs> Earlier in your presentation, you mentioned recruiting offices. I guess you must have covered that as we went on. Recruiting offices? Uh, recruiting offices? Uh, like in Beijing. India and uh, China. Ah, Beijing. Ah. So Kent State recruits, has back, um, staff on the ground who work full-time in Beijing. In fact, we have three people who work there full-time. The university, not the College of Business. Uh, because we have so many uh, students who come from that country, so we're able to share information about Kent State and um, recruit them here. Uh, quite frankly, we would have more if we had more housing. So one of the challenges that Kent State faces is we're out of housing. Uh, we're full. So last year, to give you an example, we had, uh, as a university, about 23,000 apply to Kent State. A uh, little over 7,000 were accepted, but we only have room for 4,500 uh, on campus and in the area living. So uh, all of the housing is full. All of the apartments are full. All of the dorms are full. And if they didn't pay their uh, deposit on time, they couldn't get in. So we do recruit internationally because we do want our students to be able to interact with people from around the world. Uh, and we know that that's what national universities do. But quite frankly, in some ways, it's tempered by uh, whether we can house them. So we're working on that as an institution now. Yes. There's been a trend of uh, studying off online. Mm -hmm. uh, the University of Phoenix and some others have done that. Uh, is there a downside to doing that that Kent State doesn't do, or, or, or are you heading in that direction as well? So Kent State does have a number of online programs. Um, 
but not in the College of Business. So all of those numbers that you saw relative to the College of Business are entirely face-to-face -face students. We do offer on an ad hoc basis some courses online, so you can be in Kent or Hudson or anywhere in Northeast Ohio and take some courses, uh, but at least currently in the College of Business you cannot complete a degree. We're in the process of seeking approval for what, what we call a completion degree. So if you did the first two years at one of our regional campuses or any community college, uh, beginning, we hope, if it's approved by fall of 2015, you could complete the last two years online in a general business major. But that would be the only major, and that's our first step as a college into online learning. Uh, we, do, we do have a hybrid program for the executive MBAs, as you might imagine, they're very busy people, uh, and so they do come to campus, but um, I would say a third of their coursework is online. That's the most online that we have at the moment in the College of Business. Deborah, um, one first one is a confirmation slash question. So it sounds like uh, 7,000 out of 21 applicants get in, so about a third. Mm -hmm. That sound about right? Mm -hmm. And then along those lines, what is a typical average GPA or ACT test? So it's for? going up. Okay. It used to be that Kent State gave them a floor. So you could look in our catalog and say, well, if I make this ACT uh, and I have this GPA out of high school, I'm in. That's not the case today. We don't publish a floor. We shape the class. And so um, the, we're going to take the best students typically, although we shape it for some other factors. Uh, today, the average ACT is a 23 or 24, and the average GPA out of high school is a 3.3. Thank you. Uh, second question, I'm logging the mic here. That's all right. Um, at the roundabout tuition and then room and board at Kent is? Roughly. Roundabout tuition is 10000 a year. Okay. Uh, it's like 10100 technically. Um, but it's right around just over 10000 That's very affordable compared to others in the state. Um, in terms of housing and room and board, it used to be probably even when you were there that if you were a freshman or sophomore, you were required to live on campus. Today, because of the housing, only freshmen are required to live on campus. Uh, sophomores, if they came in as freshmen, we don't kick them out of their room if they want to stay. Uh, as sophomores, they're able to stay, but they are encouraged to, to look for something in the local area. Um, I would say room and board and books, which are not inexpensive today. Uh, probably a student is paying in the range of 18000 for all of that. If they lived on campus, depending on their major, the books vary in price. So about 20, 28000 a year then? No. no, no, 20 total. total. It would not be more than 20 total. Oh, I'm sorry. 18000 total. Just a little tidbit, and I'm showing my age along with the other gray-haired fellows in this room. I graduated in 83, and it was $3,000, including room and board. <laughs> and I take out student loan for that. But, uh, <laughs> but and then the last one, you get a picture of the Business Administration building, and maybe it's too early to say anything, but Drew had mentioned to me in the past that we're a little crowded there. We're now delivering business courses in five buildings on the campus. Five buildings. Because we can't fit them. To your point, we can't fit them all in in the College of Business. Given We've grown as a university about 25% in the last decade. Uh, but College of Business has grown disproportionate to the university. So to give you some perspective, the university on the Kent campus grew 1.2% in the fall. College of Business grew 3.3%, 5% in the freshman class. So we're outpacing the growth. And we just can't fit everyone in one building. So yeah. there's a long-range plan. We're working on it. Okay. Yeah. Just a couple of comments where Phil and I went to school, obviously a lot cheaper than today, but as a comparison, all-in cost is $57,000 a year before any scholarships. Uh, so uh, can't, that, that's that's some East Coast School. <laughs> some East Coast School. But anyway, the, uh, so, obviously, so Kent's obviously a great, uh, great value for the money. But the question I have is the business analytics, is that up and running now? We're seeking approval. When you start, it would be a new master's program one year. Uh, and when you start a new program, it takes about a year to get approval from the state. We've made the first round. So initially, you send a, a rough proposal, a, a short one, and that's 
uh, sent to all the other universities in the state and they comment. We've received the comments back. They were all positive, including a very positive uh, support from Ohio State. Uh, they were trying to put one together with a couple of partners. They don't have one yet either. Um, and we believe, and they support us, that we have the faculty to do it. Mm -hmm. So we're in the process now of going through the full proposal from the Ohio Board of Regents. So we believe if it's approved, we would start it in fall of 2016. Great, because uh, when you do get it started, the company I work with, we can provide you plenty of data for that. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, I have a question. Um, one of the pro you mentioned that uh, you're recruiting internationally quite a bit. One of the problems, especially with Indian students, is they have no money. Are you providing specific financing for We don't provide students? any scholarships for international. They all pay their own way. All of our scholarships are for domestic students. Thank you. And we do have quite a few scholarships for domestic students, but that's where our we do have. Uh, scholarships for students to study abroad, uh, but we don't have scholarships for international students coming in. They're full pay. Deborah, I've got a uh, background in executive sales management, and you know, for years we have been very interested in that at that level of working with various institutions on you know creating programs for sales, you know, learning and training and understanding. What what motivated Kent to move in the direction of offering us a sales certificate? Well, it's sort of a first step into a program. It's the easiest thing to get approved, the certificate. Uh, and then you move forward from there if you want a minor or a major. So it was our first toe in the water. Uh, we had been delivering sales courses for some time, so we packaged it together to do a certificate. Uh, we're in the process of building a sales advisory board to inform that process to see if we need to do much beyond that. Um, in its first year, it's been wildly successful with employers, and so those students are in high demand. Yeah, but and it it is becoming an in, um, a program that's increasingly of interest to our students because of the high placement rate. Uh, we graduated our first set of students last year, and they were recruited all across the country, including HP came and interviewed, um, recruited one of our students out to California. Well, I would add to that. I mean, when you think about industry in general. Um, there's not a business that doesn't get into some aspect of quote unquote sales That's right. separate from quote unquote marketing. Mm -hmm. So um, I welcome and I cheer you know for your initiative there. I think that's great, and I and I think you you know your school is going to find that there is you know consistent demand for candidates out there. Oh, I think you're absolutely board. right. Absolutely. And I would offer the invitation to any of you who are interested in working with our programs. Let me know. We are in the process of building a number of advisory boards for our programs, including sales. So if you do have an interest in connecting with us in terms of helping us shape the curriculum or providing feedback, there are those opportunities, as well as speaking to classes. Deborah, yes. you know the, uh, the difference between weeds and flowers? What? <laughs> Marketing. <laughs> man after my own heart. <laughs> Deborah, just by reason of comparison, again, we're talking about what costs the University of Pennsylvania now. When I graduated in 1953, the tuition was $1,000 a year, mm -hmm. and the living expenses were about 1200 so my <laughs> education was cheap. Do you uh, offer anything in the program uh, in the business area on nonprofit management at all? Uh, we do not have any uh, specific programs to nonprofit. Um, we do <coughs> offer uh, a lot of work with nonprofits, so a number of our courses. We do have a requirement at Kent for experiential learning so that students get hands-on experience and in business that often means working with a company. Uh, and so we do projects with companies and also nonprofits, uh, in particular in our marketing area. So we have a managerial marketing program as well as a traditional marketing program, and they often do projects in the coursework uh, that include either for-profit as well as nonprofit. Um, Deborah and Jimmy would like a picture of all the graduates from Kent State and yourself and Drew. That'd be great. So would you like to do that now? No. Deb, um, can I, uh, I mention, when Rich I think left, left the room, but you, you mentioned the concept of uh, uh, doctorates in uh, accounting. Right, we do. I thought of Rich Warfield teaching <laughs> accounting <laughs> so shiver down. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> That, that would be illegal. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to congratulate you because I think, you know, a lot of, you, you think about alumni, you think about development, which I'm sure you're, you, you're 
Well, and I will tell you, we have expanded that area. Drew is, as you were introduced to him earlier, is on our development staff. Um, when I joined, we had one person. Uh, we have three currently. Drew is one of the three, and we are currently hiring a Ford. I think it's very important that the college is connected to its alumni and also the business community, and we can't do that unless we have staff like the career service staff who go out and they're the bridge between the college and the employers, and staff like Drew who go out and connect the alumni back to the college. To me, that's critical to our success. I think you really hit on it there. The idea of, it sounds like you've done a tremendous amount of work with internships and things like that, so I, think I congratulate you on that. Thank you. All right, let's grab those Kent Staters. All right. Hey, and thank you for inviting Wait, me today. It's a pleasure. Are we gonna, By the way, Drew is a Bowling Green grad, but he's working for Kent State. <laughs> 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 Come on, Dan Williams, you're a grad, aren't you? You're not going to close the meeting and then do this? Oh. No, no, we got to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I went Are to the Ohio State out? University, on. so I'll stand over on the side. Yeah, so if you can, if they can sort of tilt a little bit and then you can take it from there. Yeah, right, well, just like they're doing and right where you are is perfect. All right, let's look at, look at Jimmy's. If you'll send that to us, we'll put it out on Twitter this afternoon. <laughs> That's scary. Uh, we have a college Twitter feed, and so we'll send that the photo out. <laughs> Be careful with that Twitter feed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were applying the chemicals to the plate there. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> and then, uh, unfortunately, I'll be in uh, Benina Springs next Wednesday. I'll miss you all. But next week's speaker is Jim Garrison from Hudson Community Service, and Gail will introduce him as our speaker, and then we'll, I think James, you're having another lady. Right. The uh, <clears throat> she's the uh, chairman of the uh, Relay for Life. So. Okay, Charlotte, Charlene, Charlotte. Uh, short. short. Okay, we'll be also speaking next week, and then on the 28th we have a really interesting speaker, Mr. Gary Sirak from Sirak Financial Group, and he's done a numerous amount of speaking uh, about uh, giving, and and and. Um, uh, as far as, well, I'll let him explain, but he's a really interesting speaker, and I think you'll enjoy that one. And then we're going to have four or five hockey players come in from the Hudson Hockey oh. team on the 28th also to <laughs> figure out what they're doing this season and what they're going to do with their life. Nice <laughs> Thanks, Rich. We're going to do a couple announcements while Liz is coming up. I will mention that George Rooney, past president of the Akron Rotary Club, will be here next week to sell raffle tickets, only appropriate on such chilly days to the Chili Open. Okay, you see this? Yeah. Okay, it's a teapot. All right. Well, the reason for the teapot is um, Rotarians, we're having a Royal Rotary Women's Tea, April 25th. And please help me by encouraging all your wives and friends and daughters and granddaughters to come on April 25th. So let's keep that in our minds. Okay? Are you saying it's women only? Well, do you want to help serve? <laughs> you, can help, you can help serve. This is okay. a sexist organization. I'm <laughs> shocked. Rotary history is being made, right? <laughs> and understand from social that Playhouse Square, right, January 24th. From our social committee and wrote, uh, the Rotary Cavs game event January 30th, 7:30. Cavs play Sacramento reception. Rotary reception before the game 5:30 to 7 p.m. If anybody's interested, let me know. So a fast thank you to our greeters John Hairston, our new Rotarian, and Ron Strobel, and our AV team. Thanks James for manning the camera. And for setting up and tearing down, Jimmy Sutphin, Ron Barnhouse, Larry Santon, and I don't know if you helped James, but thanks anyhow. <laughs> so we're ready for our drawing. He's applied. <laughs> so get your tickets ready.
Yeah. Make, make it right. Power it out. Help those who came here early. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it's me. Oh, oh James. Oh, the payout is eleven dollars. Oh, and we'll see if you're gonna win two hundred and forty four. There goes the Warfield this school of business, yeah. right? <laughs> Darn. <laughs> see you next week. Have a good time. <laughs>